we're not practicing on an island. You can't build a wall around colonoscopy. Dr. Larry Kuzinski, thank you so much uh, for uh, coming uh, to this conversation and having this chat with me. Uh, I uh, want to welcome you first. Thank you very much for uh, asking me to be part of this interview. I uh, look forward to it. Uh, so Dr. Kuzinski, I want to start by asking you uh, how your life has been uh, a full-time or near full-time in a digital health uh, startup as uh, uh, the chief medical officer of Sonar MD, and how how does that uh, differ from uh, being in uh, private practice GI? Night and day, <laughs> it's a totally different experience. I love being a gastroenterologist. I spent my entire uh, adult career as a practicing gastroenterologist. I loved the patient interaction. I loved I loved the interaction with all my colleagues. I felt so good that I was doing something meaningful for people and helping people in their everyday lives. But I always had this burning desire to, to do something more. I've always been a problem solver, so it was easy, an easy transition into this, but my transition from clinical practice to chief medical officer of a startup company was a very easy one for me to take. That, that, that move was not difficult at all. And I transitioned through it over the course of a few years. And last year, when I finally ceased practicing, it was almost anticlimactic. I finished my last procedure, which had 15 polyps. Supposed to be an easy procedure, but the last procedure I did as a gastroenterologist had 15 polyps. And since then, I've been extremely happy in my role. I'm still helping people, except I'm not helping one person at a time. I'm helping a lot of people at the same time. Uh, so I, I, I want to ask you, uh, go back a little bit in the history of Sonar. Uh, why did you start the company? What was the trigger? Well, I've been starting companies for 30 years. Back, but this one specifically has a, has a unique story. I was involved heavily at the AGA and have been involved since, oh God, for 15 years now. And I had sat on the Practice Management and Economics Committee for three years. And they asked me to chair the committee. So I came on as chairman of the Practice Management and Economics Committee for the AGA back in the fall of 2011. And something that I had always struggled with in GI is the lack of diversity in revenue streams of gastroenterology. So much of it comes from CPT codes that surround colonoscopy. And so when I took over the committee, I said, you know, I wanna, I wanna do something more than just put in my three years. I'd like to accomplish something. And if I could help my colleagues diversify their revenue stream and build new lines of business, I would accomplish something. And since value-based care is something that's uh, in vogue, I said, okay, what's, what's our worst, what, what are the most significant illnesses we take care of as gastroenterologists? It's inflammatory bowel disease. Those are our sickest patients, our most expensive patients, the ones that wind up having the most morbidity. So I went to Blue Cross Blue Shield, Illinois and used every chip I possibly could I played every chip to get in the door because all I wanted from them was, what does it cost to take care of Crohn's disease? That was my question. So it took a few meetings of begging before they realized this guy's crazy. He doesn't want more money. He just wants data. So they gave me an enormous data set. Every claim on 21,000 patients with Crohn's disease for two years. It was an enormous file. It crashed Excel, crashed. I had to build a SQL database out of it, which took some time. And we analyzed it. And in the analysis, I got my first aha moment for Sonar because there's a, there was a 17% hospitalization rate. 
in this patient population, which is consistent. We're seeing around 14% in our BHI database analysis today. So 17% and the doctor and me said, well, geez, what could have been done to avoid those hospital admissions? And so I went into the 30 day period before each of these hospital admissions created a query so we could see what CPT codes came out in those 30 days. And in over two thirds of the patients, none. There wasn't a CPT code. That was my first aha moment because I thought, gee, these are, these are symptomatic patients that have relationships with their doctors and they go over the cliff without realizing it. And then it, the light bulb went on in my head and I thought, that's true. I've, I've stood next to the, the, the bedside of patients for years in the emergency room and I've, I would ask them, why didn't you call me? And what the patients will tell you is, ah, doc, I have this all the time. Oh, I thought I had the flu. Oh, I thought I ate something wrong. Or they'll tell you that I'm busy with my kids or my job or my family, whatever. The bottom line is patients with inflammatory bowel disease, we look upon them as Crohn's patients or ulcerative colitis patients. They're not, they're human beings who have lives. And this illness is just one component of their life. So I said, I'm going to see if I can do something to help people present earlier in their deterioration. And I was home that night and I was watching the hunt for red October. And as Sean Connery says, send him one ping captain. I said, I need a sonar system. I need a way to ping these people in between their face to face visits. So a medical professional can decide when they need intervention. That was the beginning of SONAR. After our first year success, where we showed we could lower hospitalization costs by over 50% and lower emergency room costs by over 70%, Blue Cross then said, can you put this in other practices? And that's when I needed to form a company and that's when I formed SONAR MD. So that was in 2016. That's an amazing journey. I'm uh, curious uh, whether Blue Cross paid you that first year uh, or did they want you to show success uh, before? No, I have to give Blue Cross Blue yeah. Shield Illinois a lot of credit. They paid us. They, they gave us upfront per member per month. We had to bill it. They, they created a code, the Blue Venture Fund which is the investment fund of all of the Blue Cross plants. They pooled their money together and they gave it to a company that um, at the time was called Sandbox Industries in the Fulton Market District here in Chicago. And so uh, Sandbox came in to matter and did a shark tank. And uh, so I said, I can do this. So I was the oldest person there, the only one in a suit and tie. Uh, and I presented, I, I pitched Sonar. They liked it, especially because I had revenue. I had a contract. I was a business. I wasn't just a concept. I was a business that was generating money and, and building, and it was in their space. And so they, they agreed to invest. <laughs> March 1st, 2018, when we closed on this thing, I think it was March 6th, I was the only employee of Sonar MD. I had the investment money. I was the sole employee of this company and we had to build it. And now we have 20 employees and we've gone through series A and, and you know, we're rolling. Yeah. No. So congratulations uh, on the success uh, so far. Uh, it beats me why uh, more uh, GI doctors aren't starting uh, entrepreneurial ventures like you have. It's myopia and blindness. We get myopic. If you talk to gastroenterologists, and I love my colleagues, and I was doing this myself, you get pigeonholed into colonoscopy. You got your endocenters. 
you got all your revenue streams coming out of the endo centers. You live and die over those cases. You have myopia. You have blinders. You can only see this. You can't do this. In uh, your interview uh, in the book, Scope Forward, uh, you had referred to GI practices as colonoscopy factories. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, some thought it was harsh, uh, but for some, they, you know, it woke them up. Uh, and uh, I know for a fact that uh, it changed people's mindset, that single interview. Uh, so I, I want to ask <laughs> you, you know, what you were, what you were referring to uh, when, when you said that. Uh, and I want to tie it also to your uh, recent article uh, where you asked for, uh, called for dramatic change uh, in gastroenterology. Well, it, it referred to the same myopia I, I, I just spoke about. It's wonderful to be able to go to your endo center that you own, work with employees that you employ, and basically do the same thing over and over and over again. And you get really good at it. And everybody tells you how good you are at it. And it brings you a wonderful income. So then there's this crazy guy, Larry Kaczynski, telling you that, you know, uh, you, you should be doing something else. Well, it's like buying a stock. The, the day you buy a stock, that decision can be made. But when do you sell it? Or it's like with retirement. When do you retire? When do you, when do you bring in a new product line? Do you wait till the product you currently have has fallen apart? Or do you take the profits that you have from your successful product and reinvest them to expand so that by the time your current product starts declining, you already have one to take over or two or three, but you've, you've, you've diversified yourself. So my, the reason I said that we have created factories, we make widgets, we do the same thing over and over and over and over again. My point is, I think we should invest some of the money that we're profiting uh, from uh, I'm making these widgets to do something else that the market needs. And the market is screaming for solutions. Patients are screaming for solutions. And why don't we give them to them? Why don't we use this, this intelligentsia we have and why don't we create them? And so, you know, the entrepreneurial side of me is always looking for something else. And, you know, it's, it's just this, this itch. But from a business point of view, no one would build a business, have be a one trick pony and ride that pony till it turned into a nag. That's what we can't do. We have to invest so we can diversify. So, but uh, wouldn't your uh, colleagues argue uh, saying that it is the gold standard and there are so many people out there who still aren't screened uh, and, uh, you know, there's only more need for GI care. Uh, so, you know, why shouldn't we be serving all of these millions of people who need uh, GI care? Uh, stomach cancer or GI related cancers are on the rise. So shouldn't we be doing, in fact, more uh, colonoscopy and you're suggesting to do less. Why? I'm not suggesting to do less. That's not what I was saying. Um, what I was saying was diversifying and build. But take a look at cancer registries. I've done this. I looked at the cancer registry data in Illinois from 2006 and compared it to the cancer registry data from 2016. Now, what this cancer registry data tells you is what stage patients are presenting with with colon cancer. It hasn't changed. Despite the thousands and thousands of colonoscopies done in Illinois, 
in the 10 years between 2016, 20, 2006 and 2016. The Illinois Cancer Registry data is unchanged. So yes, it would be great if every human being came in for a colonoscopy. That would be great. But human nature is not that. Human nature is telling us that at least a third, if not more, of our patient population doesn't want to have anything to do with a colonoscopy and has their head in the sand. And those people are getting colon cancer. And like my Crohn's patients in sonar, they're not presenting early. So what we can do if we really did care about our patient population, we would be looking at what other mechanisms we can use to screen patients. And the big fear everybody has, oh, well, if we have them do FIT or something like that, then they're not going to have colonoscopies and we're not going to make money and it's going to be bad for our business. I would contend you're actually going to build your business. Because, and I've, I've, run, I've run spreadsheets that show that if you could get that 32 to 35% of the population that isn't being screened to come in for screening of any kind, you will capture the patients in there that have the positive screening tests. And they're not only going to be screening colonoscopies, they're going to be surveillance colonoscopies that you're going to be able to, to survey over the years. So let's not be penny wise and dollar foolish here. And let's do things for the right reason. If we are colon, if, if our passion is we want to eliminate colon cancer, then let's figure out more ways to do it. I, you know, that's the way I look at it. Excellent. Uh, I, I want to switch gears and uh, move to private equity. Uh, now, uh, you successfully transitioned uh, your practice to a, a P platform, uh, and, and then you retired from private practice. You moved on. Uh, and during the course of our uh, interview, this was last year in uh, 2019, uh, I asked you, uh, you know, what are your concerns uh, about private equity? And uh, you said, quote, lots, and that lots was in caps in the book. Uh, but so, uh, and, and you started uh, with culture. Uh, so, I, so now, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, to almost end of 2020, uh, we have seven uh, GI platforms and maybe one more uh, I hear before the end of the year. Uh, so, so how have these uh, concerns played out? Well, you have this little thing called COVID-19 that was overlaid on top of it. And probably the worst thing any of these platforms could have feared to happen to them was to initiate and then get slapped with a pandemic that cut the revenue stream out of that one procedure they do and depend 80% of their revenue depends on. And it's an elective procedure that people don't necessarily have to come in and get. So this has been challenging for the private equity owned practices. And most of the, most of my colleagues have, have done their best. They've really worked diligently to try to maintain, you know, their staffs, the, the viability of their, of their endo centers to, to con continue to get a return on their assets. And the investors are equally probably suffering as well. We'll see. We'll see how they come out. I think that's yet to be determined. Now, there may be seven platforms, but they're not all the same. And I like some of the newer models that are being deployed. My big problem with private equity, and, and I, I was part of the process that, that caused IGG to sell to the GI Alliance. And you know we went through this laborious process where we interviewed 20 different companies. We had multiple rounds of interviews and we chose the GI Alliance. And, and, I, and I would do the same thing again with the way the process went through. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not second guessing what we said, but as a senior guy in the leadership of IGG who stayed on 
an extra year of practice just to help them do this. I was going to retire from practice in 2018. I put off my retirement to 2019 so that I could help the group make the final decision and go through all the legal ramifications it took. And just for the record, I retired ahead of the closure. I received no funds from that purchase. I retired with zero from that. So I did that for, I had altruistic reasons for why I helped my partners with the process, but I was not doing it for any personal gain because I knew I was, I was destined to run Sonar. So anyway, there are models. My biggest challenge in the, in the current private equity structure is that this is an LBO buying a perpetuity. They're using other people's money largely to purchase the assets of the practices in hopes that they can build that business and then get out in several years. <clears throat> the practice, on the other hand, you could be a 40-year-old doc. You are giving up percentage of your income forever. That's been my struggle, is that you've got a short-term investor using somebody else's money, buying a perpetuity of your income forever. And the only way it turns out as a positive for the docs is if it allows them to continue to practice as docs, putting the patient number one in their focus. And that's a challenge. And secondly, that they continue to get payouts from the, the transfer of this ownership to other entities over the years. It's not been done before in GI. There are no second bite of the apples yet in GI. We don't know how that's going to turn out. And so, I, you know, I struggle with that. That's the thing I struggle with. Can you maintain that culture? Can you maintain the fact that you are still a doctor and that you're major focus is helping patients and generating an income in the process, but you're a doctor taking care of patients. Can that be preserved? Or is all the other noise involved in the financial aspects of this investment going to interfere with your ability to do that? That's what I was referring to when I said culture. That's the culture I hope we don't lose. Yeah. So, so there's a uh, P question, uh, you know, that I've always wondered, and I've asked uh, this to a bunch of people, and, and I want to ask you the same. So now all the valuations have been based on uh, adjusted EBITDA, uh, and the adjusted EBITDA is based off of physician productivity, or rather future physician productivity, uh, normalized compensation uh, of physicians, and 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 so on. Now that future productivity, and I'm connecting the dots to your earlier point uh, today, uh, which is uh, that that productivity currently uh, is uh, tied largely uh, to certain procedures. Uh, and going back to that point on procedures, uh, that procedure itself uh, or the revenues from that is a vulnerability rather than an asset. So if I have to connect those two dots, uh, you know, we're actually basing a valuation on a vulnerable asset, and I'm probably making broad assumptions and connecting the dots here. But, you know, this question I do have. Uh, so, you know, what happens uh, when those EBITDA assumptions uh, don't come true? Am I thinking correctly? I, I mean, I'm you curious. Are. It's like you are. You are. You are thinking exactly the way I'm thinking, because it would be better... I mean, if I was, if I was an investor, I'd look at that and say, "Oh, that's, that's a single revenue stream," and "Oh, that colonoscopy revenue stream is driving the pathology revenue stream. It's driving the ASC revenue stream. It's driving the anesthesia revenue stream." So 
if something happens to that colonoscopy procedure, the other revenue streams fall off too. And it's vulnerable. It's, it's a significant vulnerability. Plus, it's an elective procedure. It's, it's not like people are, are clamoring to get in. We, we have to send them their reminders. And, you know, I've, I've looked at the data across the country and a lot of the practices. And I don't know that, I don't know that some of the best practices are getting 50% of their patients to actually come back for the repeat colonoscopy. So it is vulnerable and I'm concerned about what's gonna happen a few years down the line here. We saw a 5% cut in colonoscopy professional revenue this year with the new, CP, with the new uh, Medicare fee schedule, it's cut 5%. So, you know, I don't think we're gonna see that, that stop. I think that's going to continue over time, and it's it's clear that the Robin Hood uh, concept that's happening inside CMS, taking from the rich and giving it to the poor, uh, they're taking money out of procedural services and moving it into cognitive services, and I don't see that stopping. I also don't see the payers stopping to find less expensive ways so that they can maintain their star ratings for screenings without overpaying for certain ex procedures. You can't stop, the, we're not practicing on an island. You can't build a wall around colonoscopy. Colonoscopy has to be able to handle the competition that's coming from exact sciences. It's coming from, it's coming from other technologies. We now have have liquid biopsy, you know, we have all this technology that's being developed to identify who is at risk for colon cancer. And so that goes back to my initial thought is you gotta have a diversified revenue stream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if you were to get a bunch of practices together or a bunch of doctors together and start over and, and build uh, a future-oriented GI practice, what would that look like? I, I've given this a lot of thought. I do believe that we are at a point in time where we can virtually integrate GI practices based upon acceptance of risk and provision of value. If we're given the data from the payers. If we have that data, we can change. That's, that's mandatory. We can't do it without the data. We can't do it without knowing. I have learned so much over the course of the last five or six years about where the costs of care lie. I have access to claims data all the time. And claims data that my colleagues do not have access to. And I can tell where the drivers are uh, for the cost of care and look at the levers that can be moved. So well-run gastroenterology practices that are factories, this, that's a good thing, okay? They've got the process down. Okay, so now look at what else you can do now to generate. I think there's value-based care revenue streams that are there for the taking if we construct it the appropriate way. Just think about this. In a, in a, in a medical practice, not just a GI practice, but any practice, patients call with symptoms, with needs, and you have a human being taking care of that. So it means answering the phone. If they can't deal with it, it gets sent to a billing person. If that can't be done, it gets sent to a clinical person. If it's really serious, it gets to a nurse. And if it's really bad, it gets to the doctor. It's a repetitive, there's hundreds of calls coming in every day in a, in a practice. Those are automatable processes. 
those are those are places where you build an automation platform and you allow AI to refine it and make it better. Yeah. I want to um, conclude our uh, conversation with a final question, uh, Dr. Kozinski. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I you know I was uh, in a conversation with somebody, and then uh, you came into the conversation. Uh, and uh, I, I think the context was uh, being successful in gastroenterology and you know doing investments or technology, building technology and so on. Uh, and uh, this individual uh, said, uh, you know, you are uh, one of the most successful uh, gastroenterologists in the world. Uh, and uh, he meant every bit of it. Uh, and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, so my, my question is, you know, let's roll back the clock a little bit and, and, and at the same time, you know, bring it to the present. Uh, if you were starting over today as a young gastroenterologist, seeing everything that's happening uh, and uh, seeing the risks, uh, seeing the opportunities, uh, what would you do? And uh, I, I would translate also that to what advice would you give uh, the younger GI community uh, you know, that is coming out to practice in this field? Well, that's, that's a complicated question. Multiple moving parts to that. Given where I was in the development of technology through the course of my career, I don't know if I could have done it much differently. I embraced technology at every stage it was presented to me. I think embrace technology. Number two, follow your passions. Don't, don't give up your passions. But the only way this works is if you master what you are doing. So you better learn to do that colonoscopy learn to do it really well. Maybe you don't need to do an ARCP. Maybe you don't need to be the guy that's doing barracks. Master something and master maybe more than one thing, but master it so that you can now say, I know that I'm gonna go follow my passion on this. Build yourself time to be able to follow your passions and stay ahead of, you know, the, the rapidly advancing core of knowledge that becomes so challenging for all of us. Um, keep your personal life in order, okay? Don't get divorced. You know, I mean, keep your personal life in order. Keep everything in line so that you have the time the intellectual space, the energy to pursue things. You know, a career is a long thing. I'm 68 years old. I'll be 69 in February. And every stage of my career has given me something that the previous stage didn't give me. And I lose something in each one. So be willing to change, adapt to change, embrace technology, follow your passions, um, I'm not the wealthiest gastroenterologist, so whoever gave you this, this, this praise of me, the one thing I can tell you I'm doing, I'm doing exactly what I want to do at this stage of my life. And that has value. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Kozinski, thank you so much uh, for uh, sharing your wisdom, uh, all these uh, insights. Uh, it, I've really benefited. I'm sure people listening or watching uh, would tremendously benefit from this. Uh, were there any final words or anything that you wanted to say? Stay well. We're almost there. This is like a marathon. We've hit the wall at mile 21. We just got to get to the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.